My name is Charles Williams. I'm a professor of English at Rancho Cucamonga's Chafee College, but today I'm here as a salesperson. I'm trying to sell some tickets, tickets on a literary journey, a literary journey studying American history through the eyes of African-American writers. I think this should be a pretty easy sell to anybody who's interested in books, anyone who's interested in good stories, as well as people who are interested in American history. I also think that this would be interesting to anyone who is interested in the definition of freedom or reminding themselves what freedom actually means. These writers do a fantastic job of writing about freedom in an overt and a covert kind of way. They do a fantastic job of exploring the unique values that make this country special, that make it so special that an ideal gift was the Statue of Liberty with her torture freedom and her broken shackles on her ankles. See, let me stop in quick moment of history. <clears throat> After the French assisted the United States in uh, gaining its independence, they had several requests. One of which was to ask each governor to just write a little bit about their territory, about their region. And most governors wrote a paragraph or two. However, Thomas Jefferson wrote an entire book, Notes on Virginia. And in this book, he discusses the economics of Virginia. He discusses their relationship with the native people. He discusses future plans, a variety of things. But he spends a great deal of time talking about slavery and he discusses it in a very disturbing uh, kind of way. In fact, I think this is the second most interesting thing about Thomas Jefferson. He's extremely pessimistic about the opportunity of blacks and whites living together here on this country. Now, he's not alone. There are several African-American writers who felt similar in similar ways and I'll add their names here as well. But most African or African-American writers were extremely optimistic. As a matter of fact, they committed their pen to paper for the very purpose of pushing at the boundaries the very idea of what it means to be an American. And so I wanna tell you about some of those texts and we'll start with slave narratives. Slave narratives often get a bad rap because of the intense tone of brutality, uh, the uh, anti-human treatment of slaves, uh, just the gore, the graphic uh, nature of the, of the narratives, the abuse of power, all of these things. And that's true, absolutely. But what we often forget is the ingenuity that takes place in there and how these slaves survived, found ways to thrive and find ways to access freedom. The survivalism, despite so many horrific encounters, they continue to strive forward. Let's start with one slave narrative. And that's the narrative of Alato Equiano. Now this is the most unique of them all because he is the only he provides the only account we have of an African who became an African slave, enslaved by Africans, sold further west, and then takes the transatlantic slave trade, comes to the Americas, and is a slave in the Americas. He, ven he eventually, uh, obviously, he learns to read and write. Uh, he learns accounting. He becomes an asset to crews. He travels. Essentially, what he tells us is... Uh, he gives us his travel journal. Uh, that was a very popular genre at the time of people who traveled the world and wrote about what they saw. In his mind, he most likely never envisioned a day where uh, Africans would be free. He was really writing about uh, his belief in Christianity and just trying to share his tales uh, like uh, so many other travel journals. Uh, that's a very powerful text. <clears throat> and it's one that we definitely should explore. Excluding a lot of Equiano, there are two types of slave narratives. One type was recorded and written roughly around the 1930s during the Depression as the government tried to find work for unemployed writers and artists. You can find recordings and written texts of those testaments. Another type of slave narrative was written before the Civil War. And these were written with the express purpose of ending slavery, telling the world the story. Of those, there are several popular ones. Harriet Jacobs comes to mind. Harriet Wilson comes to mind. But two stand out. The most famous is perhaps Frederick Douglass. 
of which uh, sold, I believe, the most copies. And two things stand out uh, uniquely about this. One, I'm reminded of a passage in the text where he tells us as he's about to escape, he says to readers that he can't tell us how he escaped because he wanted to not spoil that route for other slaves that might want to take that journey to freedom. The other thing that stands out to me is the uh, his discovery of one of the tools of enslavement. And he realizes that that's literacy. He realized that in order to keep a person enslaved, they have to keep them ignorant. Once a, a slave becomes enlightened, becomes educated, become, becomes informed about the situation, it's very difficult to keep them in chains. Right? Again, these texts are rich with the testament of freedom. Another uh, slave narrative that stands out to me is William Wells Brown's Clotel. Uh, excuse me, that's not a narrative. That's actually a piece of fiction. It's actually the first African-American novel. And William Wells Brown is an amazing, uh, amazingly fascinating person. He escapes slavery. He writes about it in his own autobiography, but he uh, travels and goes to Europe and he begins to put on shows in Europe, anti-slavery shows. And he created uh, maybe the first multimedia art he created canvases that were sort of like, say, the curtains in your home. Large, long, tall of drawings. And he had about 25 in there on sort of a curtain rod. And he would slide them through and tell the story of American slavery, share the horrors, and, and with the objective of hoping to entice the Europeans to uh, support the anti-slavement movement even more. Uh, William Wells Brown writes a novel called Clotel, or The President's Daughter, which gets to maybe the second, uh, excuse me, the first most interesting thing about Thomas Jefferson. It was rumored at the time that Thomas Jefferson, who was very critical about the ability of Africans and Af Af uh, descendants of Africans living with Europeans and the descendants of Europeans, yet he was sleeping with uh, a slave and uh, impregnated her and gave her several kids. Uh, uh, so that, that's a separate issue. And um, William Wells Brown writes about that. Now, at the time that he's writing, pre-Civil War, it's almost a rumor. And so he writes about it as if what would happen to this child, this child of bi-ethnic identity. And it's a pretty fascinating tale. It's a tragic tale, but it's definitely one worth reading. Uh, as I bring this this section of this presentation to a close, I want to just point out some other writers, some poets that are definitely worth exploring, who are writing poetry in this antebellum period, in this pre-Civil War period. Jupiter Hammond and Phyllis Wheatley. I want to I share some artists who were uh, resisting the idea of freedom of, of of slavery in a very aggressive way. David Walker. We've got slave narratives from uh, the testimony of Nat Turner before he was executed. We've got people who wrote about uh, Denmark Vesey. There are a host of things. And then there are historians that have done a fantastic job of trying to clue us into some of the complications. Uh, one of which comes to mind is this text here, The Black Jacobins by the historian uh, C.L.R. James. This is a fantastic tale of the, the Haitian Revolution. Uh, where slaves revolted uh, against their masters. Another <clears throat> is John Hope Franklin's uh, Runaway Slaves, an am a amazing tale full of rich stories. Many of you perhaps have heard about the slave that uh, 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 enclosed himself in a box and had it mailed to the north. That's how he gained his freedom. Or the couple where the wife was bi-ethnic and could pass for white. And they escaped the South by pretending that this was the mistress and her slave. And they moved to the North. Fantastic tales, rich stuff, all indicating that there's a deep burning desire of these people, these writers, these characters to grasp freedom uh, like none other. I mean, you, you uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson and, and Henry David Thoreau and Emily Dickinson, these are fantastic writers that are writing about different ways to express their freedom. These writers are attempting to do that too, but these writers first have to secure their freedom. They're 
struggle is a bit more existential. It's a bit more deep. I mean, you know, Herman Melville's Moby Dick is one of my favorite novels, but its primary character uh, decides to take to the sea because he feels like it. He's tired of society and he wants a little more. Well, uh, the characters and the runaway slaves in John Hope Franklin's nonfiction, uh, they don't have that luxury. You know, they have to travel to get out of horrendous situations. So uh, keep that in mind here as I'm trying to make the sales pitch about the beauty of uh, the black literary world. And by the way, all of these texts that I've been talking about in this video go well with our library Civil War collection. So hopefully uh, you found some texts interesting and you will do some deeper exploration. Now I want to discuss literature from the Civil War forward. And I want to talk about it in terms of genres, that is the different types of writing. So um, let's begin. Uh, one of the things that the black world is good at is it appeals to different types of readers. There's nonfiction, there's fiction, there's poetry, there's drama, there's all types of things. And we're going to start this discussion with the essay. And I want to take you back to just after the Civil War to a major debate in American society. And the question was, We've just freed roughly 10 million slaves. What do we do with them? And there were lots of ideas, many of them bizarre. But the two dominant, the most prominent ideas were ideas by one writer by the name of Booker T. Washington, who I'm sure many of you have heard of. And he advocated that the industry leaders in America integrate these newly freed slaves into their workforce, just pay them this time. There was a competing idea by a, uh, another writer slash philosopher uh, slash professor, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, who makes the case that education is the way. And this is really a big deal in the black world. It's a debate that rages on even to this day. Uh, but I've got to say at the particular time, uh, Du Bois won the argument. Now you can find these essays in their respective books. Up From Slavery is a fantastic text that Booker T. Washington tells us his life story. And within it, he gives us this essay where he makes this case about integrating African-Americans into industry. And he also tells other stories of being a young teacher, uh, working with minimum resources, teaching in a school without walls, and slowly building that school wall by wall. That's a phenomenal story. Du Bois tells similar stories of traveling on horseback to sleepy, small Southern towns and asking the town leaders if he can use a building, a facility to teach African-American families, to teach their children in the evening. Uh, these are great texts that uh, reek of the very essence of what it means to be an American. It reeks of that ingenuity. It reeks, it reeks of that, that drive, that, that motivation uh, that, that we have. Now, I mentioned at the time Du Bois won this debate. And it's evident in a follow-up essay that he wrote around 1906 called The Talented Tenth. And in this essay, he makes the case that the African-American community needs at least 10% of its population to become doctors, lawyers, teachers, scientists, and politicians to help lead the other 90 forward. People bought into this idea. Many grabbed, uh, began to garner whatever the resources they could to send their kids to school. And roughly 20 years later, we get an explosion of educated African-Americans and it manifests itself in something called the Harlem Renaissance, of which there is a phenomenal essay called The New Negro, which describes that process of what this has brought forth, educating a generation of people uh, what they can do with this education. Uh, you can just imagine that now you've got more lawyers, more doctors, more teachers, more scientists. They can make more money and sustain an artistic community. So what also emerges out of the Harlem Renaissance is art. And there is also a famous artist from the Harlem Renaissance named Zora Neale Hurston, who's written uh, an essay, How It Feels to Be Colored Me. Uh, in this essay, she has this fantastic line. And by the way, this education has enhanced their sense of awareness of who they are. So they speak with confidence and they act with confidence. And she writes this essay talking about how she's moving her life beyond 
the racial construct that she wants to escape this dynamic of feeling as a victim. So uh, she has this line in the essay that's that that where she says, uh, "It's beyond her understanding how anyone can deny themselves the presence of her company." Right? Only one with a good sense of self which generally comes from a quality education, uh, could make a statement like that. There are other essays that uh, I suggest that you explore in the black world. There's uh, one that comes in the late 1960s by Larry Neal and a writer by the name of Amiri Baraka uh, called The Black Arts Movement. And it's describing how in the late 60s, artists have to integrate their the, the political complications of the time into their art and to do anything less is to uh, not be true to oneself. And then there's another essay that emerges in the 80s uh, called The New Black Aesthetic, written by a writer by the name of Trey Alice, which sort of uh, is a continuation of that, except for it's looking at the children of many of the black arts uh, uh, artists, many of the political activists of the 60s, and how these people sort of moved into the middle class and they sent their kids to good quality schools and they integrated them into society. And uh, they are the children that essentially gave birth to hip hop culture who uh, made Nike a multi-billion dollar company, right? So this is the new black aesthetic. Uh, there's um, another famous book, uh, Between the World and Me. This is very hot right now. Uh, Coates is, um, is on lots of shows and many are, are discussing this is uh, one of the best books of uh, past five years or so. Uh, one of the things that he, one of the arguments that Coates makes in this text is uh, indirectly and directly, but mainly indirectly, is, is an argument for reparations. And so if you're interested in, in these types of discussions, this is another great book to read. Uh, as I move away from essays, I wanna just mention two more names relatively quickly. Uh, uh, Carter G. Woodson, who, uh, wrote uh, The Miseducation of the Negro. And he's also one of the key reasons why we celebrate African-American History Month. And then James Baldwin, uh, who is also a novelist, uh, but I find his essays to be what's most moving. So so these are some essays that you can uh, look into uh, if you so desire. There are also some playwrights that I wanna introduce you to. Two off the top, I wanna to just mention their names. Amiri Baraka and Ishmael Reed, both great writers. I suggest diving into their work. But two that I want to spend a little bit more time talking about are Lorraine Hansberry, the author of the play, the playwright that gave us Raisin in the Sun. And if you find yourself interested in Tainasi Coates' arguments about reparations, um, either for or against it, I think her play, which was written in the 1950s, sets the context for these discussions a little bit better than most texts do because it talks about housing issues in the black community, particularly in the North. And it talks about generational wealth, uh, how impactful that is within a family. But more importantly, and more specifically, when it comes to housing issues, uh, her, her play grapples with redlining uh, in a very uh, uh, ubiquitous type way, right? Uh, <clears throat> redlining is, is delegating African-Americans to certain communities and not allowing them to buy property and others. So uh, I find uh, that's a great play to explore if you are interested in that subject. Also for just the interpersonal dynamics, it's a family with like a with, with very rich personalities. Uh, this play has been made into a film three different times. Every 25 years they remake it. I think the best one is to is the Sydney Poitier version. So I, if I were you, I'd try and find it. Uh, that film version. Reading it is okay, but I think watching Sidney Poitier in that cast uh, uh, act this all out is fantastic. The other playwright that I want to discuss is August Wilson, who has written a, uh, at least 10 plays, and he's dedicated one to each decade of the 20th century. His plays are rich in dialogue. They have complex characters that are beyond good and evil. Uh, they, are, they are often everyday setting. For example, one uh, takes place in a in a um, uh, at a cab uh, taxi cab service, uh, but they have extraordinary dynamics. Uh, one of his plays is called Fences. I think that's maybe the most famous. 
Uh, another is the piano lesson. That's pro quite popular as well. Uh, my favorite, in case you're curious, is uh, Joe Turner's Come and Gone. I, I think one of the streaming services has just released another one of his plays in a cinematic version, Ma Rainey's uh, uh, Black Bottom. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> these are fantastic texts. And uh, again, he's written one that takes place in each one of the decades of the 20th century, trying to grapple with complex issues that emerge in the black world with the political times as the context. So I, I think these are plays that you might, might like. Now I wanna talk about poetry and I wanna focus on just two poets. Uh, there are several others that I could go on and talk about and I'll just list their names here and just uh, quickly just read them. Nikki Giovanni, Leroy Jones, Claude McKay, Audre Lorde, uh, Alice Walker, Melvin Tolson. All these are, are fantastic poets, but they're just two that I want to uh, say a little bit about today. Paul Lawrence Dunbar uh, was a poet around the turn of the century, the early 1900s. And by day, he was an elevator operator. At night, he was a poet. Uh, he's the author of the poem Sympathy. Uh, you might have heard uh, about uh, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings, right? Uh, he's also written a, a poem called We Wear the Mask, which is quite apropos uh, for the dynamic of his life of being an elevator operator. People see him as one way. They have no idea what he's really thinking or feeling inside. And he, had, he w would write poems and try and make a living off of this. And the market was only asking for certain types of poetry, and he wanted to do other things. They're saying, well, as an African-American, we want this from our African-American poets. Um, and he wanted to be more free. Uh, eventually, he gets in the publishing industry and sort of solves uh, that, that problem. Another poet that I want to spend time with is maybe the most famous African-American artist, and that's uh, Langston Hughes, who was a central figure in what we call the Harlem Renaissance. That's around, it takes place around the 1920s. And the whole world was in love with Langston Hughes for a while. Uh, many artists that you've known, many uh, famous white artists at that time would come to Harlem and he would play their tour guide and introduce them to other uh, famous artists, dancers, and musicians in, in Harlem. Uh, many of his poetry is deeply reflective, but it's also rich in imagery. And what I love about it is it's, he's one of the few poets that his work reads as good as it sounds. So I, I, I suggest that you dive into some links and hues. I suggest you dive into any uh, uh, of the poets that I've mentioned uh, and it, or any poet in general and challenge yourself, uh, particularly if you're not in the habit of reading poetry, uh, grab a poem. I would start off with something relatively short and I would read it a couple times. One of them has to be uh, allowed. Uh, <clears throat> read it multiple times, try and identify who the speaker is. Try and identify who the audience is uh, and pay attention to some of the images that the artist is trying to, to illustrate to us. Uh, for many of us, poetry is sort of a mystery. Uh, but if you approach it this way, then it uh, becomes sort of a mental exercise. It's like deciphering a puzzle. Uh, so I suggest this is a nice way to start. There are more deeper, more complex strategies after that, but that's a nice way to start reading it aloud, reading it multiple times, identifying images and so forth. Uh, the other thing that reading poetry does is it um, <clears throat> expands our worldview because it's difficult to get into a poem without feeling a sense of empathy with the writer. So I challenge you all to do that at some point, And this is a very good list to start with. The final category is my favorite, the novel. And I could go on and list about 20 different novels, but uh, I want to start off with some honorable mentions. Uh, one is a novel called Mumble Jumbo. Another is Alice Walker's color, The Color Purple. Richard Wright's Native Son played a big role in uh, my own personal education. Uh, and Train Whistle Guitar by Albert Murray, the late Albert Murray. Uh, I've also already mentioned uh, Clotel as being the first novel written by an African-American. Now I want to give you four more and say a little bit more about them, sort of advertise them and spark your interest. One takes us back to Paul Lawrence Dunbar. It's a sport of the gods. And <clears throat> this is a novel about the fragility of uh, economic stability. Uh, it's a reversal tale where people who are on top come down to the bottom. 
And this happens in the white world as well as in the black world. It takes place in the South as well as in the North. It's a very pessimistic novel, but it reads quickly and it gives you a wide view of how delicate our, our situation is as well as how intertwined our relationships are, uh, no matter what one's ethnicity is. Okay, the second novel that I wanna discuss is Their Eyes Are Watching God. And this is by Zoya Neale Hurston. Uh, this is a novel that comes out in the late 20s. Actually, I want to say 1932. Excuse me, 1932. And uh, this has a female protagonist. And it follows, if you're interested in Joseph Campbell, it follows the hero's journey quite well. Uh, it's a portrait of the black world that is beyond racial conflict. Uh, there is some interaction, but very little. And you see people living their lives, having problems like regular people do without the burden of racism in their face. It's a fantastic tale and also an easy read. The third novel is Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man, which is considered um, the most list and top five, top 10 uh, greatest American novels. Uh, it's a novel about alienation. It's a Bildungsroman novel. It's a coming of age novel. Uh, it's a novel of, of someone searching for themselves, trying to figure out who they are in this world. Uh, it's got elements to it that explore <clears throat> the, the human experience uh, uh, smashed up against technology, uh, the struggle of labor, class struggles. And what is really rich about it is it gives you a pretty panoramic view of the different types of blackness, right? Uh, many novels by black people or about black people, there's generally one or two categories. You know, there's a good black and a bad black. This novel is a little bit more complex and it shows you a uh, panoramic perspective. Uh, the fourth and fourth and final novel is The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison, who may be the finest writer uh, in, in America, possibly. Uh, I go back and forth. Um, this is, a, uh, The Bluest Eye is a surreal novel. Uh, all of her novels have an element of the surreal to them. I, I think it's a smooth read, though it's a very tough subject. Uh, it's really about how the external world plays a deep part on the internal world. And so it's protagonist Picola is a young black girl who's uh, struggling with some issues and uh, she's losing badly. Uh, nevertheless, uh, all of the novels mentioned are uh, uniquely American in the sense that they are grappling with the struggles that individuals have within the promised land, a land of plenty, yet many are living without, a land so advanced, yet so impersonal. Now, I want to bring this to a close by mentioning just three more texts. Uh, I could mention thousands more. Uh, these three represent those categories that don't really have names, right? Uh, these are nonfiction texts that are historical. Uh, uh, they deal with social issues and they deal with politics. Uh, and the first one is medical apartheid. This one is for those who do not have, excuse me, who have a strong stomach. Uh, in a pandemic, this is an interesting uh, discussion, when, particularly when we talk about the disparity of the disbursement of vaccines and the reluctancy that many people have toward vaccines. This text tells us why. Um, uh, it's very well researched. Uh, it's not an easy read, but it is an intriguing read. Another is Collective Courage uh, by Jessica Gordon Nimhart. And this is about co-ops, which are sort of a obscure secret in American society, but they may be the answer to lots of different problems. This is about people pulling their money together. It might've started in slavery where slaves do odd jobs on the side after hours working for their master to gain money so they can buy a loved one out of freedom. It might be a community putting resources together to uh, uh, survive, right? Uh, so uh, it's a very interesting uh, text that just explores the history of this uh, process within the black world. And the final is Derek Bell's Faces at the Bottom of the World, which uh, by my account, is the first book on critical race theory, which is a pretty popular term nowadays, uh, particularly after the unrest uh, uh, and events that took place uh, this past summer. 
Um, <clears throat> this was, let me just double check here. Uh, I want to say 1992. Yes, this was published in 1992. And it explores this concept. Um, so many people talk about this, and I'm not exactly sure if the people who talk about it have actually read books about critical race theory. Uh, so this is one of the, this is either the first or one of the early texts on this. So again, I'm attempting to um, uh, showcase various texts and hopefully you find these interesting and intriguing. Hopefully you've learned something. Uh, maybe you've uh, been familiar with some of these and uh, you wanna have a conversation about them or if you are interested in more titles, reach out to me, uh, send me an email and you have a good day. Mm -hmm.